All right, so in the last video of this three-part series on tropical cyclone formation, we kind of take a step ahead, sort of bridging between tropical cyclone formation and tropical cyclone intensification by looking at this idea of a wind-induced surface heat exchange. So this wind-induced surface heat exchange, or WISHY, and I don't want to hear any jokes about wishy-washy science or anything here. I've heard too many of them from too many punsters in the atmospheric sciences. You can also hold it against me if I use any such puns in the course of this discussion or otherwise. But regardless, this idea of WISHY stems from the top down and somewhat of the bottom up paradigms for tropical cyclone formation. We're looking at a thermodynamic process by which the atmospheric boundary layer destabilizes. Uh, wind induced, so there has to be some wind at the ocean atmosphere interface that leads to surface heat being exchanged from the ocean, which is warm and has a very high saturation specific humidity or water vapor mixing ratio, to the atmosphere that lies above, which is cooler and has a lower specific humidity or, satur or water vapor mixing ratio than the saturation value associated with the sea surface temperature. So in its most basic of forms, this is simply the process by which the atmospheric boundary layer destabilizes. Recall during stage one, we cool and dry, but humidify that boundary layer, and we need to rewarm and re-moisten it through these surface heat fluxes to allow for thunderstorms to develop during stage two. But where this wishy process really comes into play is once you have a tropical cyclone form, and a tropical cyclone can gain its energy that way. This wind-induced part amplifies as a tropical cyclone's wind amplifies. It's a nonlinear feedback. And the surface heat exchange will show that that also amplifies because the lower pressure of the cyclone creates a greater difference between the saturation specific humidity of the sea surface temperature as you go to lower and lower pressure and that of the air that resides above. And so this is sort of a self-reinforcing nonlinear feedback process once you get a tropical cyclone having formed. So this is where this part about it being more toward intensification than formation comes into play. But at its most basic level, this wishy process is also crucial to destabilize the atmosphere once you are going from stage one to stage two of the tropical cyclone formation process. We represent this in terms of enthalpy, which is comprised of sensible and latent heat exchange. In our last video, we introduced this idea of moist static energy, which had three terms to it. G times Z, gravitational constant times height, C sub P times T, specific heat times temperature, and L sub V times R sub V, the latent heat of vaporization times the water vapor mixing ratio here. Enthalpy has that same formulation, just dropping the GZ term. So you're looking at C sub P times T and L sub V times Q, or R sub V, depending on whether you look at it in terms of saturation, or sorry, specific humidity, or water vapor mixing ratio. There's a constant that is technically supposed to be in there, but the two dominant physical factors are temperature and moisture. And so enthalpy exchange, our temperature exchanges are sensible heating and our moisture exchanges are latent heating. And it's from the underlying ocean to the overlying atmosphere, induced by the wind blowing on that interface between the ocean and the atmosphere. The magnitude of this surface heat exchange is directly proportional to both the near surface wind speed, that idea of a nonlinear feedback process, faster winds, greater heat exchange, and what we call air-sea disequilibrium. So remember, equilibrium is something that's in balance. Disequilibrium is something that's not in balance. And this is measuring the change in temperature between the ocean and atmosphere for our sensible heat and the change in specific humidity or water vapor mixing ratio, depending on whether you want to use one or the other between the ocean and atmosphere. And this is contributing in our latent heat flux formulation. So let's take a look at what those fluxes actually look like. So you can, come, you can formulate a surface enthalpy flux that looks like these two that we have here, but is related to enthalpy rather than to separately sensible or latent heat flux. But here I think it's a little bit more illustrative to look at sensible and latent heat fluxes separately because they allow us to see the temperature and the specific humidity dependences that we see here.
So each of these has a leading negative sign times the density. We have the specific heat for sensible heat. We have latent heat of vaporization for the latent heat flux. We have a C sub H for the sensible heat flux and a C sub E for the latent heat flux. These are exchange coefficients that govern the rate of energy exchange from the ocean to the atmosphere or vice versa. And these are assumed to be positive values. Each one of these then has the magnitude of the 10 meter horizontal wind uh, here, which is just our 10 meter wind speed. And then we have our air-sea disequilibrium term that shows up in the parentheses within each one of these. It's always atmosphere, so two meter temperature minus ocean temperature or sea surface temperature. Atmosphere, the specific humidity at two meters minus the saturation specific humidity because we're dealing with the ocean we're dealing with water it is saturated there governed by the sea surface temperature or the ocean temperature that we see here so in the case where the ocean is warmer and has a higher saturation specific humidity than the air that resides above these terms in parentheses are negative the leading negative in each one of these cancels them out Density is positive, C sub P and L sub V are positive. C sub H and C sub E, our exchange coefficients are said to be positive. And of course the 10 meter wind speed is also positive. So when the ocean is warmer and or has a higher saturation specific humidity than the atmosphere specific humidity, these fluxes, latent heat flux, sensible heat flux are positive. Upward transport for uh, these two fluxes here. And that's ultimately what we're going to be dealing with when we're looking at tropical cyclones here, or even more generally before they form in terms of the recovery of the boundary layer air from the warm and moist ocean below to the relatively cool and dry atmosphere that resides above. So let's take a look at some of our underlying assumptions that enter into this wishy process here. We're assuming that the atmosphere is saturated. At the end of stage one, we have saturated the atmosphere through that initial round or multiple rounds of convective activity. With a nearly uniform moist static energy, roughly along the blue dashed line that we see here on the left side of the profile, and a moist adiabatic lapse rate over a deep vertical layer. So we're looking at something with a nearly moist adiabatic lapse rate where we have a fairly uniform equivalent potential temperature uh, over this deep vertical layer from the surface to the atmosphere or to the troposphere up through the troposphere up to the tropopause. We assume this passive role of thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are ongoing. We've recovered the boundary layer air in terms of tropical cyclone formation and intensification. So we've been able to reignite thunderstorms by some means, and they're vertically mixing moist static energy gained from the underlying ocean upward. So we start off as we described in the last video down here in the uh, boundary layer near the surface. Our saturation moist static energy related closely to our saturation enthalpy is over here by the red star and we're here in terms of moist static energy or enthalpy. So we gain from the ocean here, thunderstorms occur and then spread that upward and that helps to drive the whole profile from this blue dashed line on the edge of the blue shaded region toward the right as you gain more and more energy from the underlying ocean, essentially driving this profile toward the right, toward what the ocean is actually able to support here. Temperature only changes, and I apologize for this getting cut off by the uh, video here, it only changes in response to surface enthalpy fluxes. The thunderstorms loft this heating vertically, mix this heating vertically, gained from the underlying ocean. They themselves specifically are not the heating source, they are the conduit for the heating to be spread throughout the vertical. Ultimately, the spread of the heating throughout the vertical governs the intensity of the tropical cyclone. Comparing this blue dashed line here in terms of the vertical profile to this blue dashed line over here. The further to the right that you can get the profile toward the saturated moist static energy, the greater of a warm anomaly you're going to be able to develop in the middle to upper troposphere and even down toward the low levels compared to the surrounding environment. And the greater the warm anomaly, the more intense the tropical cyclone. And that feeds back in and of itself as we'll describe here in just a few moments. 
So let's take a look at the WISHI process itself. And we're going to use this schematic here, which is a vertical cross section. So height is on the Y axis and radius is on the X axis here. The center of the storm envisioning a mature tropical cyclone in this case here is depicted between the two thunderstorm towers that we see sloping outward away from the center of the storm here over a small radius. So this distance that we see that the cross section is cutting across is on the order of hundreds to over a thousand kilometers away from the center of the cyclone. It's depicted by four legs, A to B, B to C, C to D, and then D back down to A. And we'll take each one of these in turn. Note that there's a B prime and a C prime here. We'll, come, we'll talk a little bit about this later on in this video, but we'll really highlight that in our next series on tropical cyclone intensity change. So in this leg one from A to B, we're dealing with isothermal or constant temperature for low level inflow going from larger radius toward the center as the air spirals inward toward the center of the tropical cyclone. So let's put that into motion. And as it does so, it goes from higher pressure away from the center, maybe the pressure is 1,013 millibars, and then maybe near the center, it's something like 990 hectopascals, or for a really intense hurricane, 930 hectopascals. The point being that as the air flows right above the surface, its pressure is going down because you're getting closer to the center of a low pressure feature. Because you're going to lower pressure, you have adiabatic expansion. And we know that adiabatic expansion causes the air to cool. However, offsetting this, it is offset by surface sensible heat fluxes. You're gaining energy from the underlying ocean. There's also something that is known as turbulence kinetic energy, which is related to small scale turbulent motions within the atmospheric boundary layer. The energy that's associated with those turbulent motions sometimes dissipates into the form of heating, and this helps to offset that adiabatic cooling. So as you cool by expansion, you offset that by heat gained from the underlying ocean and this dissipation of turbulent energy and ultimately result in a constant temperature as air flows inward. So maintaining this surface temperature as you flow inward shifts the moist adiabat when you get to the ascent leg further to the right. Think about a skew T and how the temperature lines are skewed. From your perspective, they'll look like this. So as you go up from the surface, uh, say 1,000 hectopascals, and you're still at the surface, but maybe you're now at 950 hectopascals, going up that isotherm pushes you further to the right on the skew T in terms of the moist adiabat that you're ultimately going to ascend along. So this is a crucial aspect to fueling the tropical cyclone. That surface sensible heat flux uh, helps, to maintain, helps to push you further to the right, or more generally that surface enthalpy flux pushes you further to the right. Indeed, moistening through those surface latent heat fluxes drives your dew point profile further to the right on the sounding as well. And so as you bring your moisture profile further to the right, and as you bring both of them upward on your sounding, you're pushing yourself further and further to the right on the skew T in terms of the moist adiabat that you're then going to ascend along as you go upward from there. So the key idea here is that Assuming that the sea surface temperature, T sub ocean, is constant as you go from large radius toward the center of the storm. This decrease in surface pressure toward the center actually also increases the air sea disequilibrium. Not only are you offsetting the cooling from this adiabatic expansion as surface pressure decreases by surface sensible and latent heat fluxes, you're also increasing the difference of the saturation specific humidity associated with the ocean to the specific humidity of the atmosphere that resides above. That saturation specific humidity is a function of pressure. The specific humidity is not, but saturation specific humidity is. So for a fixed temperature, decreasing the pressure leads to a greater saturation specific humidity. And so that term in that parentheses for the latent heat flux, that Q sub V of the 
ocean gets larger and larger for that constant temperature that the surface sensible heat flux helps to maintain, which allows for the surface latent heat flux to become larger and larger as you go inward as well as as the tropical cyclone intensifies. This too helps to shift the profile further to the right on the skew T. So independent of that uh, ocean temperature, however, 10 meter wind speed also typically increases as you go inward. Light winds on the periphery of the storm increasing as you get closer to the center of the storm. And these also increase as the cyclone intensifies, which then also fosters larger surface sensible and latent heat fluxes. So a lower pressure leads to a greater specific saturation specific humidity, greater saturation specific humidity, which increases that air-sea disequilibrium there. In addition, as you get to a lower pressure, wind speed typically goes up, and as your pressure deepens, as the cyclone intensifies, the wind speed also goes up. So you get to this multiplicative effect of increasing the air-sea disequilibrium in terms of the moisture difference in particular, but also the ability to extract that because of having a faster wind speed passing over the ocean there. So as we get to this second leg here, we've brought air in along the leg A to B, and it's gained enthalpy or more static energy from the underlying ocean as it has done so. Now it reaches to the center of the storm and it ascends moist adiabatically and then flows outward near the tropopause here along this leg B to C. So let's put that in motion. And there it goes. As we just discussed, that surface energy exchange determines that moist adiabat along which air parcels ascend. So in particular, the further to the right you can get on that skew T for the moist adiabat that then goes up like so, compare that to the moist adiabat for the environment. The greater the difference between the two, oh, bring that over here, the greater the warming that you see as the air parcel ascends within the cyclone as compared to the environment. The greater the warming, the greater the height and pressure difference between the environment and the storm and the more intense the tropical cyclone. A weaker difference between the two means that there's less warming. And that's the uh, characteristic of the earlier development and the earlier intensification stage. As you become more and more intense, you extract more and more heat from the underlying ocean that then drives you from this state further like so with your moist adiabat. So as I was kind of highlighting here, that magnitude of the warm thermal anomaly aloft which reflects that cyclone intensity. It results just from comparing the moist adiabats of the ascending air and of the undisturbed environment. The greater the surface heat exchange associated with the greater ability to extract sensible and latent heat from the underlying ocean, the uh, further to the right you will be on the sounding for your ascending air along this leg B to C, and the greater the warm anomaly you'll get and the stronger the cyclone you'll get. So we go to leg three, C to D, we're dealing with isothermal compression on the initial descent from the upper troposphere or lower stratosphere. So we're in the outflow layer at large radius away from the center of the storm, and we are descending from leg C to D. Note the symmetry, A to B was isothermal here. C to D is also isothermal. As we go down, temperature is increasing due to adiabatic compression. However, it's offset in this initial descent by evaporative cooling. You start off saturated here within the cloud layer of the tropical cyclone outflow near to the tropopause. And as you reach to this outer environment, what moisture is left in the condensate form, typically snow or ice crystals at these altitudes, evaporates, sublimates and evaporates causing uh, the atmosphere to gain water vapor content, but to cool as a result of the latent heat that has to be taken in to accomplish that sublimation or evaporation. So consequently, you have isothermal descent here, the adiabatic warming offset by evaporative cooling here. 
This finally brings us to the final leg, D down to A, which is moist adiabatic descent from the upper to the lower troposphere at large distances away from the center of the storm. Note the symmetry to the leg B to C. This was moist adiabatic ascent here. Now we're dealing with moist adiabatic descent. And you might be asking, why is this moist adiabatic? It's well away from the core of the cyclone, well away from the cloud and thunderstorm activity. And descent typically follows down the dry adiabat and the water vapor mixing ratio line. So how do we have moist adiabatic descent here? Well, we're dealing with warming due to adiabatic compression. That's what we talk about with going down the dry adiabat and the water vapor mixing ratio line. But this is very weak, very slow descent. So this can be offset by radiative cooling. So as this air descends within the cloud-free environment, you typically lose heat to outer space in the form of long wave cooling. It's assumed that this partially offsets the warming due to adiabatic compression that takes place, leading to a mixing ratio, or sorry, a um, uh, lapse rate that is very close to moist adiabatic for these parcels as they descend downward. And it's assumed that the moist adiabat along which they descend is characteristic of the environment. So there's some energy lost in this isothermal descent from C to D that leads to this moist adiabatic descent matching the lapse rate of the environment or approximately matching that, bringing us back toward the surface here at point A for us to then gain energy from the underlying ocean once again and repeat the process if air were to cycle through the storm in such a way. We can conceptualize this in a very similar diagram in terms of the work done or the energy available to the storm. So this diagram here at left is just another representation of what we've had on the previous slides. We represent the four legs. A to B on our leg, uh, our diagrams is A here. B to C is this leg B here. C to D is this leg C here. And then D to A is this leg D here. We said that A was isothermal and C was isothermal. So temperature is our y-axis on the diagram here at right. A here is isothermal. It is at a constant temperature given by this air surface temperature T sub S. C here is also at a constant temperature, T sub O, given by the outflow temperature, whatever the temperature change that the air parcel has experienced along leg B between the surface temperature and the outflow temperature. Going from C to D in our previous diagrams, it maintains that temperature as it does so, just as it maintains the temperature going from A to B at low levels that we have depicted here by this A. The moist adiabatic ascent along leg B and descent along leg D change temperature. They have to. You have to go from this surface to the outflow temperature from A to B and from the outflow temperature to the surface temperature along D to A from our previous diagrams. But the moist adiabatic process, ascent or descent, conserves a quantity known as entropy, which is very closely related to pressure, temperature, and water vapor mixing ratio content. And so it just so works out that this moist adiabatic ascent or moist adiabatic descent approximately conserve the entropy, whether that be the ambient entropy or the moist entropy. Moist entropy being that within the uh, updraft of the storm and the ambient entropy being that associated with the descending motion at larger radii. So as you go along this leg A and gain energy from the underlying ocean, we've talked about that in terms of the surface enthalpy flux or the moist static energy. Entropy is just another analogous way of representing the same thing. It's, a, it's not quite interchangeable, but for our purposes, we can consider it interchangeably, similar to equivalent potential temperature. All four of those quantities can be viewed quasi interchangeably for these purposes. So while temperature is maintained, entropy, enthalpy, moist static energy, and equivalent potential temperature increase as you go inward toward the center of the storm. And then that value is maintained as you ascend 
within the center of the storm and then go to outer radii through the outflow layer. Likewise, as you descend at larger radii, that moist adiabatic descent, you have lost entropy from the moist value to the ambient value along the descending leg C, but then maintain it as you cool from the outflow temperature to the surface temperature along this leg D here. You might be asking, why do we care about this? And this is where these two different squares, A, B prime, C prime, D, and A, B, C, D come into play. A to B prime to C prime to D can be viewed as sort of the early process of the storm. The fluxes uh, of energy from the underlying ocean are not as strong. And so the gain of enthalpy, entropy, moist static energy is not as large as if you have a more intense storm and you go from A to B here. Similarly, the amount of enthalpy or entropy that you've gained leads to your ability to ascend the air being somewhat less than in the case where you have greater gain of energy from the underlying ocean. So you cut off B prime to C prime like so. So this white square, A, B prime, C prime, D has one area, but if you have greater energy gain, a, B, C, D gives you another area. And the amount of work, the amount of energy available to fuel the cyclone's winds is directly measured by the area of these two squares. So if you have a greater ability to extract energy from the underlying ocean and then use it to fuel the cyclone, as opposed to modify the boundary layer or anything like that, you'll be able to put more of that energy into fueling the winds. Whereas if you have less energy gained or you have to offset some of it to maintain a warm moist boundary layer and atmospheric profile, you'll have less energy that can then go into fueling the tropical cyclones winds. We'll talk a lot more about this in our next lecture series on tropical cyclone intensity change. This gives us a little bit of a preview for why we care about some of this terminology, A to B to C to D, or these legs A, B, C, D like we see here. It's important that they are isothermal, that they are moist adiabatic, A and C and B and D respectively, from an energetic standpoint. But the key idea, you're gaining energy from the underlying surface that then spreads vertically throughout the depth of the troposphere and the comparison of that energy that has resulted to the ambient environment measured by uh, leg D in particular gives you a measure for the intensity of the storm. So summarizing and putting this all together here. We start off very early on in the tropical cyclone formation process with weak surface enthalpy fluxes. You've recovered the atmosphere through the initial surface enthalpy fluxes. You're at the end of stage two of the development process. You have a tropical cyclone, but your winds are weak. So you only have weak upward directed enthalpy fluxes. The thunderstorms that are there mix that or loft that upward over a deep vertical column, which strengthens or creates your warm anomaly aloft. Because of this warm anomaly, you have the greater thickness within the tropical cyclone core. So you have relatively low heights and pressure near to the surface. So you have reduced surface pressure in the cyclone area. This has two effects. Remember this increases the saturation specific humidity because we're dealing with isothermal inflow. So you're going to increase the ability to extract enthalpy in particular water vapor from the underlying ocean. You're also going to increase your horizontal pressure gradient. I apologize that pressure gradient got cut off there, but reducing the surface pressure in the cyclone but not changing it outside of there increases the change between the cyclone and its environment. This leads to an increase in surface wind speed. The change in pressure, the pressure gradient magnitude is one of the contributors to wind speed, whether you're looking at any of the wind balances, geostrophic, uh, gradient, or cyclostrophic wind balance. The combination of increased surface wind speeds and increased air-sea disequilibrium increases the surface enthalpy fluxes. They're no longer weak, maybe now they're moderate. And this brings us back to the second box here. That heat is then mixed or lofted upward, strengthens the warm anomaly, further reduces the surface pressure, further increases the disequilibrium and the pressure gradient, 
further increases the wind speeds, further increases the surface enthalpy fluxes, and then you come back up here. So you're driving your moist static energy profile to the right within that diagram. You're expanding the area of that square on the previous slide, and you're intensifying the tropical cyclone. So this wind, this wishy process is that which describes how heating from the underlying ocean in the form of surface sensible and latent heat fluxes, or more generally surface enthalpy fluxes, is used to fuel the winds of a tropical cyclone with thunderstorms spreading that vertically throughout the atmospheric column. This idea of wishy and the surface fluxes provides a measure for the amount of energy that can be put into the storm, which is directly related to the sea surface temperature, because that governs the ocean temperature as well as the saturation specific humidity of the ocean. So there's a maximum amount of energy that can be input to the atmosphere from the ocean residing above. In our next video, as we move into our tropical cyclone intensity change series, we'll use that information to derive what is known as a maximum potential intensity, relating the energy that can be put in relative to its dissipation by frictional drag and other means. So until then, thanks for tuning in and please make sure to use the discussion forums. There's been a lot of topic, a lot of topics here in this video and in the previous two that are quite a bit different from those that you might have seen in previous videos. It's much more thermodynamically intensive, much more dynamically intensive. I've, these videos are long because I've tried to step through them very clearly and very carefully, but that still doesn't uh, account, change the fact that a lot of these ideas may be new or at least presented in new ways from what you're used to. So this module's uh, discussion forum really focuses on you asking questions, present me with the material that is most confusing to you. Help me to know where you're at coming into this and coming out of this set of videos so that I can then meet you where you are and help advance your knowledge to the point that these videos are really trying to hammer home at. So I really encourage you to make use of those discussion forums, make use of email or office hours, uh, help me help you through this more complex material in this set of videos, as well as those into next week's videos. But until then, thanks for tuning in.